Shalom Aleichem, everybody. Welcome back to the Yibane Beit Midrash. Welcome home to Torah. Uh, we want to dedicate this Shi'ur. The learning should go towards the Rifu Shalema for Brea Bat Chava and Chaim Aryeh Ben Rivka. We deal with some very uh, fundamental things here, and a lot of it is not PC. So tonight especially, it is not politically correct. Hang in there. Hopefully we won't get banned. Um, but I want to mention in advance that the Hebrew source sheets that we use are, there's a link down below in the description box, and uh, we encourage you to uh, follow along in the Hebrew. Um, also, there are uh, links to previous classes as well. And if you haven't yet subscribed to the Yibinet YouTube channel, you may still do so, and you might as well hit that notification bell on the way uh, so you'll be notified when new classes are uploaded. We're in Parshas Noach. And you'll find this in, in Genesis chapter 9. We're going to deal with one particular verse. <laughs> we can talk for an hour about one verse. Yes, that's true. So Noah, the tiller of the earth, was the first to plant a vineyard. He drank of the wine and became drunk, and he uncovered himself within his tent. In Hebrew, it says like this, V'yachel. V'yachel could mean began. We'll see Rashi explains another level. It doesn't mean that it doesn't mean that he began, but it means that there's also another issue here, and it's related to the word chulin, which means to profane. He profaned himself. Okay? So that's the first word. Vayachel. Noach ish ha'adama. So Noach profaned himself, or if you want to just say that he, he began, or the first thing he did was plant v'yita kerem. But he is called the tiller of the soil, or the man of the earth. However you choose to uh, translate that. So what we'll actually see is there's different levels to one word, because it is true that, yes, he was the first to do so, and that will be an issue we will discuss, as well as what, what kind of debasement, what kind of profanity that he caused for himself through this uh, drunken, well, let's just say from planting the vineyard first. And then the rest of the verse says, Vayisht min hayayin, yes, he drank from the wine. Vayishkar, he got drunk. Vayitgel. Now that is not an easy word, but we will discuss what that means. He somehow unrevealed, he revealed himself. He uncovered himself. Betoch Alo, within the tent, within his tent. So let's look at Rashi. Rashi says right away the word Vayechel can be understood, yes, as Chulin, a language of profane. Because why? Listen to the words of Rashi. For he should have first engaged in planting something different. So the first thing he did was planted a vineyard. And the Medrash says that he shouldn't, basically, he should not have planted the vineyard first, from which wine is produced, but from other trees. Okay, that's really the only thing I wanted to mention, particularly about the vineyard, and why he, well, let's just say, uh, the, the Pusik and we read Rashi. Let's get into the meat and potatoes of the Kliakar. And that's who we use for the basis of our discussion, the Kliakar. Okay, so... In the middle of the page, it says like this, Hulashen Chulin. This is a language of, if you want to translate it as pro profane, or let's leave it like that. Because why? Rashi says, actually the Kliakar explains what Rashi means, Hachulin Hefech HaKadusha. That this concept of being profane is the opposite of holiness. Or at least, yeah, that's how we're going to translate it. Kedusha to this point. So therefore, chulin is profane, uh, the opposite of holiness. Now, this next statement the Kliakar is going to make is a, a running theme for the Kliakar, but we're going to see the source, 
And he says, Any place that you find. Now, Geder literally means a fence. And Erva literally means uh, nakedness. But in this case, it means um, sexual immorality. Okay? So any place that you find some type of obstacle, some kind of guard, something that's preventing you from this uh, sexual impropriety, Sham Timsa Kedusha, that's where you will find holiness. Now let's go into the source sheet, and number two in the source sheet, it says, this is from the Midrash uh, Vayikra Rabbah, 26.4, Um, he goes like this: Amar Rabbi Yehuda ben Pazi, Mibnei Manis Mecha Parashat Arayos Leparshas Kedoshim. See, back in in Vayikra in Leviticus, you'll find that all of the various um, the various illicit relations, the the illegal, criminal, uh, immoral, sexual relations are found in Parshas Kedoshim. So you have the Ayarot in, right, in Parshas Kedoshim. So you have a juxtaposition. So there's a reason. It teaches you any place that you find some kind of a guard, a fence against sexual immorality, what do you find? Atam Motzei Kedusha. Parshas Kedoshim, Kedoshim to you shall be holy. The Asakahada the Rebbe Yehuda ben Pazi, and we find a similar statement. The Amar Kol Mishu who go there Atzmo min Ha'erva Nikra Kadosh, that any one who guards themselves from sexual immorality is called holy. That's going to be the source. So whenever we're going to hear again the Kleikar use this theme, the Kleikar didn't make it up. This is an ancient source. And now we know why. Because erva, all the different lists of the erva, you'll find in Parshas Kedoshim, and therefore you are called holy. Okay. Now, he says like this. This is where the drinking part. I told you in the beginning, this is not going to be so PC. This is going to upset a lot of people who like to drink. Aval hayayin margil erva. Now, what does that mean? That wine causes one to become accustomed, feel that it's okay, regil, regular, in sexual immorality. Now, we have a verse in Hoshaya 4, verse 11. You'll see that number 3 on the source sheet. So it goes like this. Znut v'yayin, v'tirush, as if all three... Okay, what are Znus is sexual immorality? Yayin, as obviously that's we'll call that old wine because Vitirush is new wine. Yikak Lev. It grabs your heart. It takes your heart away as they translate it. Uh, Rashi says there that the harlotry and the old wine, as well as the new wine with which they are involved, have captured their hearts away from me. That's what God is saying. Now I just want to stop here for a second because what is the lave? Right? The lave, it seems like it's right here in the middle of my chest, beating. Yes and no. That's not only the seat of my heart. My heart, my soul rests on my heart. And my heart here is in the, where the soul is. And the soul is in the upper part. We call it the moach. Right? Thinking. And we're going we're gonna to discuss this a little bit further so you have a better insight what we mean by your heart. But it, it will... Take away your heart, meaning, let's just say, your, your sane thought processes. Uh, you, you know, knowing there are consequences to your actions. Uh, that's the truth about Znus as well as wine. Now, there is in Shas, which you have behind me, the, the Oral Torah, there are six orders of Mishnayos. And within Seder Nashim, that's dealing with women, laws of women, seemingly, you have Nazir and Sota. Sota is obvious, but why would Nazir be right before Sota? 
The truth is, interestingly enough, there is a Gemara in Sota, page 2a, that actually discusses this very point. So, at the bottom of this, of, of this source, it mentions that in chapter 6 of Numbers, you have, um, you have the Nazir, and in chapter 5 of Numbers, you have the Sota. So you see that, and this is what they're going to say, that if somebody was up on the Temple Mount, watching the procedure of a Sota, which I'll describe in a second, they would likely want to cause themselves to take an oath not to drink wine. Okay, so let's back up a little bit. So the Gomorrah, this is the Gomorrah in 2a of Sota. The Gomorrah questions the placement, the very smichut, of the Mishnaic order in order of Nashim. And uh, the Tana arose from tractate Nazir, which is the tractate preceding Sota in the order of the Mishnah. So what did he teach? What was Rabbi Yehuda Nasi teaching that Nazir, in Nazir, that required that he teach tractate Sota immediately afterwards? So at first glance, there seems to be no connection at all between the tra this tractate of Sota and that of Nazir, but the Gemara itself gives an answer, and it's in according with the statement of Rabbi Yehuda Nasi in regarding to the actual sequences of the Parsha itself in the Torah. So he explains what I just said. You have chapter 5, which is Sota, and you have 6, which is Nazir. So this will teach you that anyone who sees her in her state of disgrace, as she undergoes the rite of the bitter water, would renounce, should renounce wine. As wine is one of the causes, ready for this? Drum roll, please. Wine is one of the causes of sexual transgression as it loosens inhibitions. I'd like someone to argue with me about that. Apparently... That is a statement made in the Gemara. I believe that it's true. For the same reason the Torah teaches the passages one after the other, Rabbi Yudah went ahead and he arranged the tractates in the same way, but in the opposite. Now, what is a sota? I don't, this is not the topic for tonight, but if a woman, a married woman, was a secluded with another man who was not her husband, and her husband was jealous and had warned her, don't do this, and he has his suspicions about her, so she'll be in, if she's in denial, of course. So then we have like this uh, truth serum, a truth test. And basically she will be made to drink certain waters. These waters are consisting of the Parsha of the Torah that has God's name that described the Sota. It is erased, by the way. We never erase God's name, but the Torah itself describes this is what happens. And they take that ink powder, put it into the drink. She drinks it. Now, if she is guilty, she'll die. She won't die on the spot, but her stomach will blow up and she will perish. On the other hand, if she's innocent, there is an exoneration for her, and there is going to be a blessing of Shalom Bayis, and Bezrat Hashem, at some point, she will become pregnant, and uh, that would be a, um, a tikkun for the, uh, the, 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 the Shalom Bayis issues that need to be fixed. Okay. So now you know what a sota is. So apparently, if there was this seemingly chashash suspicion of sexual impropriety, it might have happened as a, as a result of the wine, and therefore someone was witnessing this um, procedure, this ritual on the Temple Mount, they may, would, may, they may take or they should take upon themselves uh, the abstinence of wine as the Nazir. For those who are not familiar with Nazir, you can look it up, but basically you're talking about a, um, a person who has made an oath not to drink wine, not to have their hair cut, not to go into a cemetery and whatnot. And uh, it's, a, it's a temporary uh, situation. Anyway, so the clear carpet continues. I'll just read what he said last, based on uh, that last, that last um, statement in Sota. Kol horoe Sota bilkukula yazir atzmo minayayin. Anybody who witnesses this sota lady in her disgrace would swear upon himself, would take upon the oath of a nazir away from wine. So the Kleokar continues, it's four lines down in the middle. Alkein his kir bo lashon v'yachel. Now we understand why it doesn't just mean he began, but simultaneously, it means that he disgraced himself. 
Sha'agidei netiyazu nase chulin v'yitgal besoch aholo. That it was through this planting that he made himself disgraced, and he was the yit gal. We still don't know exactly what that means, but he somehow uncovered himself. He was disgraced and uncovered himself within this tent. This word the yit gal has many meanings as well. The chen yit bayer lekamen bezrat Hashem bepasuk. Later on, the clear car explains that in cha- in Numbers chapter twenty five. Verse 1, he will discuss this. So in Parshat, um, and one second, in Numbers 25, 17. I just want to read the verse to you. It says, Israel settled in Shittim. This, um, in, in, dealing with Balak, wanted to curse the Jews. He failed. He couldn't curse the Jews. Instead, he blessed them. But there was plan B, to get them to sin. If you can get the Jews to sin, Basically, they'll curse themselves. I mean, if his goal is to have them cursed, and it would be easier for him to curse them if they were not right with God, as the verse says, Israel settled in Shittim, Vayeshev Yisrael Bishittim, and guess what the next three words say? Vayechel Ha'am Luznus. It's right that the people began to commit adultery, or if you want to translate it, the people disgraced themselves with adultery. El Benos Moav, with the daughters of Moav. Rashi says, just so we have it clear, right, that to commit adultery with the daughters of Moab, he says, as a result of Bilam's advice, as is stated in, Parsh, in, um, in Sanhedrin, in Chelek. Okay, so now let's continue on with the Kleokar. And he ends by saying, Va'ayin gam parshas noso be'inyin nazir v'asota. He'll discuss that also in parshas noso, the whole idea of the juxtaposition and the similarity between someone who becomes a nazir after witnessing the sota. Okay, the next paragraph begins like this. V'karo ish adama. Why is he called a tiller of the ground or literally a man of the earth? So the Kliakar has some amazing insights. Ki pu'ula zil, this action that he undertook, hayasa mipata choymer, asher min ha'adama motza'a. Because man has two components. He's a physical being, but he's also a spiritual being. So from the aspect of his material being, where did we come from? Why is Adam called Adam? Because he comes from the Adama. So from the aspect, he's an ish hadama. He himself, the aspect of his physical self, was the one that led him towards planting this vineyard first. Okay? And then he's going to now discuss the seichel, the spiritual aspect, or let's call it the intellectual aspect, because as I mentioned many times, the word seichel in Ramban, Maimonides' terms, is intellect, and in Maharali, in terms, it means spirit. Now, you may say, oh, it proves here that he's talking about the spirit. I would agree. Aval ma'al. Right? But the seichel part of a person, that is a portion, a, a part of God above, so to speak. Now, you can look at Job 31.12 just as a source for that. And that says, now what is the portion of God from above? Um, he's talking about himself, um, that he has. Ma chelek elukai mi ma'al v'nachlat shedai mi marom. Right? He's talking about that heavenly aspect of his being, the soul itself. By the way, just to keep with the same theme, that we are made of the physical and the spiritual, in Genesis chapter 2, verse 7, where it says, The God, Lord, formed the man of the dust of the ground, and he breathed into his nostrils the soul of life. Vayipach bi'apov nishmat chayim. Okay, so there is interesting Rashi on this. He made him of earthly matter and of heavenly matter. The, earth, the body of earthly matter and the soul of the heavenly matter. Um, one other th- thing, I just want to show you the end of Rashi, a living soul. See, cattle and beasts were also called living souls, right? Nefesh Chaim. But this one of, one of man is the most of life of them all because he was given additional intelligence. 
He additionally was given intelligence and speech. By the way, the Ankalus explains there when Nishmas Chaim that he was given this uh, soul of life, that it's a um, ruach malala, meaning a um, a speaking spirit. So let's just keep that in mind when we open our mouths, that we make sure that we reflect the uh, Creator who made us, um, because that is the godly part that's expressing itself. But let's just take it as, the, we're going to translate Seichel as spiritual intellect. He says like this, What happens, uh, the Ish Adama, the physical part of Noach, is what wanted to plant this Kerem, the vineyard. But the Seichel part, which is very godly, the soul part of him did not agree. It didn't really want to. It was negged. Why? Why would the real soul be negged? Because the soul, or let's say the spiritual intellect, knows that the wine causes him to be in a state of confusion. Right? The opposite of sober... <laughs> Whatever mibabel siklo. What? How would you translate it, Rabbi Yochanan? Siklo. No, uh, mibabel siklo. Ah, uh, Can, off course. Off course. Very good. Off course. His soul is off course. Okay, let's continue. Davar acher. Karu, again, why is he called Ish Adama? Meaning, alternatively, another explanation. Why is Noah called Ish Adama? See, the, <coughs> the Kleokar says, Shahalach bedarche Adam Rishon. He followed in the ways of Adam the first man. What did Adam the first man do? He was Shachot the He sinned with Geffen. What does that mean? There are four different opinions of what the tree, the fruit of the tree of knowledge and good and evil was, what type of tree it was. So I do have here Brachos, page 40. Let me just see where. Um, it's number 8, 40a. The truth is, I don't know why, I don't know if I didn't bring down the whole Gemara, but uh, the, the first opinion says like this. It's Rebbe Meir. The tree from which Adam, the first man, ate, Rabbi Meir says, it was from the vine. As nothing brings wailing and trouble upon man, even today, other than wine, as it says in regard to Noah, and that's our verse in chapter 9, verse 21, and he drank from the wine and became drunk. Rabbi Nehemiah says it was a fig tree. Um, I just want to go to Rabbi Yehuda, says it was wheat. And if I'm not mistaken, the, uh, the fourth opinion is that it was the citron from the esrog. Okay, I don't want to stick, I don't want to spend too much time on that. Uh, you guys could go into the Gemara and figure it out. Okay, Devar Acher. This is uh, another opinion, alternatively, that it's the Yayin Shigoyrem Lo Shiyetse Rucho Yashuv Maso Kodem Zmano. Remember the original question, why is he called a man of the earth? I know we translate originally as a tiller of the earth, but literally means a man of the earth. So the Cleocar says it's wine that causes his soul to depart from him and return to the ground before it's time. What does that mean? That means that it doesn't extend your life expectancy. It actually would reduce your life expectancy. Now we will discuss the difference between one cup of wine and many cups of wine. Okay? I know doctors say one cup of wine a day is enough. Let's see. Commotion Amar. Now, there is a verse, and I want you to bear with me, in Proverbs uh, 14.12. Now, even though we'll read the English, it doesn't make sense in the English. It makes much more sense in the Hebrew. There is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is ways of death. Okay, very nice, very nice. Right? Each person thinks what he's doing is right. Okay, so people think what they're doing is right. How do you know what's right and what's wrong? Well, you have the Torah. But in the meanwhile, in Hebrew it says, Yesh Derech Yashar. Usually we use acronyms to describe what we call the first letter. In Hebrew we call it Roshe Tevos. The first letter of each word can spell other words. Well, we also do Sofi Tevos. So we're going to look at the Sofi Tevos in a second. So... 
I'm um, sorry, Sophie Tevis, uh, shortly. Um, Rashi says there regarding this idea, oh, I didn't finish the last part. Yesh derek yashar lifneya ish, so each person thinks he's doing the right thing. Va'acharita, but in the end, it's derek madas. It actually leads one towards death. Now, Rashi says, there's a way that seems right to a man. He commits a transgression, and what does he say? I didn't sin. In fact, I did a mitzvah. I'm doing good. It's the right thing to do to speak all this lush and horror and tell everybody to warn them. Well, you better speak to your local Orthodox rabbi first and find out if that's really true. Have you confronted the person? Did you have a private conversation with the person? There's a lot of things that go into this before you go out and put it on the, the uh, Times Square neon lights, right? By the way, I just want to continue with the Rashi because the rest of the Rashi explains when it says there's a way that seems right to a man, gives uh, Esav as an example. Okay, I want to go back into this idea of the clear car because it's absolutely fascinating. As I mentioned to you, if you look at the Sophie Tevos, we're on the second line down of that paragraph. You see the Yesh, that's a Shin. Derech, it's a Kuf. And Yashar with a Resh. Shikr. Shikr means drunk. Okay? So the last words of there is... Um, a way that seems right to a man. The last letter, Sophie Tevos, Shechar. Okay, which means either strong drink or drunk. Kiko Shikur, because anyone who is drunk, Yitalek Lame Sharim. He goes in what he thinks is straight. I know that the police, if they would ever pull one over, pull someone over, they're going to ask you, right, if they suspect that you're drunk, to walk in a straight line. And the person says, oh, of course I can, because everything looks like it even plain to him. But the truth is, it ain't. Okay, but he thinks it is. Okay, now, I want you just to look at number 10, because we will quote it shortly, but I want to skip to it. Uh, Talmud Bavli Yoma 75a. So there's an argument between Rabbi Ami and Rabbi Asi. And the Gemara, the Gemara continues with another dispute they had in regard to the correct interpretation of a particular verse. That particular verse you can find in Proverbs 23.31. You'll see that number 11. It says, Do not look at wine when it is red. When he puts his eye on the cup, it goes smoothly. Now, again, the, he, the English doesn't do it any justice, Look in the Hebrew when it says at the end, it goes smoothly, Yitalek b'meisharim. It means that you'll walk in a straight path, meaning you think you're walking in a straight path. If you put, look at Rashi, don't put your eye on it. And whoever puts his eye on it goes smoothly. Whoever is habitually drunk, all transgressions appear to him to be straight. Or it will always appear to be straight. Okay, so this is the problem. Now, in Hebrew, B'meisharim means straight, right? Like a plane. Like not a P-L-A-N-E, but a P-L-A-I-N. A plane. An even Stephen thing. I want to continue with the Gemara. Uh, Rabbi, Ami, Rabbi Ami and Rav Asi disagree. One said, whoever cast his eye on his cup, which means habitually drunk, then all the prohibitions with those whom relations are forbidden seem to him like level, mishur, level ground, like a plane. He's unaware of the pitfalls of sin and continues walking along a twisted and dangerous path. The other one said, we don't know which one, but the other one said, whoever cast his eye on his cup, the whole world seems to him like a level ground. So, which means that not only is such a person unconcerned by forbidden sexual relations, but all other prohibitions, monetary prohibitions and so forth, they all seem permitted in his eyes. So basically we're going with, with the second opinion. The Kleokar continues. He says like this, In the beginning we said that all sexual uh, improprieties seem to be um, okay to do. 
Kach Darshan B'Gemor. It's exactly what the Gemara Darshan's out. But in the end, we saw the opinion, Lav Dafka Arayot, it's not only and specifically to sexual relations. El Kol Chatas, V'Kol Avon, all types of sins. Hakol Yashar Be'enav, everything seems permitted in his eyes. V'lo Yodo Ki B'Naf Shohu, now he doesn't realize that it's going to cost him his life. May, it may not cost him his life in this world, but usually heavy drinking certainly does. Ki hayayin mi nefesh ad basur yikale. That the wine will take him out from his soul all the way to his flesh. It will consume him. Now we do believe in a soul-body connection. So, you know, if you um, are a healthy person and you're drinking, or you think you're drinking uh, uh, physically, you're still okay. There's no question that if you are in this category of a drunkard, there's no question that it's affecting your soul, and therefore it will also affect your body. Now, interesting, the actual verse in Proverbs 14.12 ended with, his end will be uh, ways of death. So its end, v'achrito, its end are ways of death. Now, if we again, we, we spoke about the Sophie tables, right? Go back to the beginning of the verse and take the last letter of the first three words, first three words, right? And it says, Yesh Derek Yeshar, Haim Darche Mavos, which spelled out drunkenness. So Ki Hashechar, right? So basically, Ki Hashechar Hamashaker Hu Derek Mavos. It's the wine that causes you to be drunk. That is what's leading you to your death. That's how we understand it. And it's remez le Noach. It actually, it, there's a hint to Noach or through Noach. Because when it's written, yayin, the word yayin is yud yud nun. Now we can spell it out. Each letter, each letter is a word. Like aleph is aleph lamid pei. So you have three letters, Aleph, Lamed in the middle, Pei at the end. So when you take the word Yayin and you spell it out, and you take the last letter of the word Yayin, of the word Yud Vav Yud, I'm sorry, Yud Vav Dalid, Yud Vav Dalid, that's Yud twice, and Nun is Nun Vav Nun, so you take the last letter of those three letters spelled out, and you come out with the Gematria, Gematria means the value of the letters it actually adds up to 58, which is exactly what Nun Chet. Nun Chet is the Gematria 58. It actually spells out Noach's name. Okay? And this is a hint. Because he was the first one to become involved in this planting. Now, Natiya can also mean he headed in this direction, uh, to lean in a certain direction. So this is a very fascinating clear car so far. And we're going to continue. Chazal say in Breshit Rabbah. Um, 36.7. Let's see what I have on my sheet. This is in number uh, 14. Uh, you can see on number 12 and 13 we already did. Um, Basically, it says like this. And he drank of the wine and was drunken. Right? It says, Vayisht min hayayin vayishkar. So what is, the, what is the measure telling us? He drank without measure and was shamed. You drink, you don't measure it out, it's going to have some very negative, dire consequences. Reb Chiyab Ar Abba said, it was the same day that he planted it, he became drunk, and he was also humiliated on that day. Now we're going to talk about the word Vayitgal. Vayitgal. What does it mean? And he was uncovered inside his tent. Vayitgal. Rabbi Yehuda the, uh, said of the, in the name of Rabbi Hanin, in the name of Rabbi Shmuel bar Rabbi Yitzhak, that you know what it doesn't say? What you would have thought that he was uncovered, vayagel, that he was just uncovered. That's not what's written. It says vayitgal. Now, what is exile? Galut. There's a relationship between this word and what 
Noach did, because he is the father of all mankind, you know, after the flood, he, um, he brought about the exile for himself and his generations and the future generations. Now, like I said, this is not very PC, but we're all praying for Mashiach, right? We're all doing our best with Torah mitzvahs. And listen to this. The 10 northern tribes were exiled because of wine and excess. And Yehuda and Binyamin were exiled because of excess wine. Why are we making the same mistake? Listen to what he says. This is the Medrash. The ten tribes were exiled only because of wine. It says in Isaiah chapter 5, verse 11, and it, you'll read later in Isaiah chapter 28, 7, about Yehuda. It says, Woe to them that rise up early in the morning, that they may follow strong drink. Isaiah is giving them rebuke, okay? As well as the uh, tribes of Yehuda Minyamin, but these also erred through wine. So you see that when he's speaking to Yudim bin Yamin, he says, they also, Gam Ela Biyayin Shagu, this is a reference to Yehuda and bin Yamin, that they're also doing the same, pro the same thing that the earlier tribes in chapter 5, verse 11, were being rebuked for, for having uh, been too much involved with, um, with wine. Um, there's also in chapter, in, in number 17, Amos, prophet Amos, chapter 6, verse 6 and 7, just to show you, uh, who drink from basins of wine. He's also, he lived at the time and gave rebuke to the northern tribes before the uh, exile, who drink from the basins of wine and with the first oils they anoint themselves and they feel no pain concerning the destruction of Yosef. They're about to be uh, exiled. And the verse says, Now, therefore, now they shall go into exile at the head of the exiles, and at the banquet of the haughty shall pass away. Um, Rashi says, what, it mean, what does it mean, who drink from the basins of wine? Because in Hebrew it says, Mizrake, that means like a bowl. They drank from these bowls. Uh, one opinion is they would throw their cups at, at each other. Some explain that this was the name of the vessel that had two mouths and it was long. And one would drink from here and the other one from the other side. And it would be cast from one's mouth to the other mouth. Okay. It means they really had a fun time drinking, basically, which is not a good thing. Okay, so let's continue in the Kliyakar. He just quoted us the Bereshit Rabbah. And it goes on. It's the, right? Shagaram levan of galut ba'avon. That what caused... Noach's children to be in exile. So this is, we're talking about the Jewish people, by the way. They were thrown into exile for this sin, as we just read in Prophet Amos, Hashotim b'mizrake yayin, and we explain that. Um, you can also find, I don't know why I didn't bring it down, but in Jeremiah 49.15, and in Ovadia chapter 1, verse 2. Similar ideas. So he says like this, perhaps, Ulai, Shezek Kavanata Midrash Samasik B'Yilkut. So I actually have the Yilkut in front of me. It's number 18 on the source sheet. It's in, uh, it's Remez Breshit uh, Samech Aleph. So I, I made my own translation. We'll do the best we can. Vayit Karim. So yes, it, the verse says he planted a vineyard. Likroto Satan. <laughs> the Satan greeted him, met up with him. Amale, and he said, You know, let's plant this together. Let's join forces. Be my partner. I'll be your partner. We're going to have a good party, the Satan says. Aniviata, you and me. So he says back to him, Okay, okay, let's do it. Miyad hevi tachila rachla. So right away, they brought a sheep, a female sheep. Also v'shachato alagefin, and they slaughtered it next to or upon the vineyard. V'achal hevi arye, and then the next thing they did was brought another korban. They brought a lion and slaughtered that. 
Ari echad v'shachatu al oto agefen. So they brought one lion and they slaughtered it by or next to the um, the vineyard, the the gefen. V'chazir echad v'shachatu al oto gefen. Then they brought a pig, a pig, a chazir, and also slaughtered it upon the vineyard. Mipne ma'asokein hasatan. Why did the Satan do such a thing? Ready for this? When, the, uh, when a human being, when a person drinks just one cup, the way I understand this is he becomes like a sheep, his sheepy eyes, sheepy eyes, let's say sleepy eyes, and he becomes very meek. Now, to me, that means it's a good thing. Uh, lowly of spirit, which is a good thing. However, when he drinks two cups, then he becomes brazen and like a hero, like a lion, then he starts speaking about grandiose things about himself. Who's like me? I'm, <laughs> I'm God's gift to the world, right? All your inhibitions, man. You got nothing holding you back. Ah, what happens when they drink three or four cups? Then he becomes pretty soon like a pig. And then he gets, uh, becomes like a pig, it's dirty with clay and slime. Um, he even gets dirty with meraglaim is a nice way of saying he urinates on or she urinates on herself. Okay, so this is an interesting um, uh, medrash. However, this actually hints to the different exiles that the Jewish people went through. Usually, we don't count Egypt although there are those that do. We talk about the four exiles, which are really eight, but let's just take the four. So we'll take the, the first one is Bovel, then there's Persia, then there's Greece, and then there's Rome. But here, these animals represent a certain paradigm uh, um, examples of the exile. And he says like this. First of all, he quotes this idea, Shinizdaveg lenoa hasatan, Kishinotokerem, paired up, joined up to Noach, the Satan, when he planted this vineyard. V'shochat lefanav mitchila, and he shechted, he slaughtered in front of him first the sheep. V'acherkach an ari, the lion. V'acherkach chazir v'chulei. Okay, that's the medrash we, we saw. Now, the Kliakar explains. Yesh benistaros remez l'shlosha galio to yeduim. This is like a hidden hint. It's like embedded within this in a code. The three exa, three of the known, three of the well-known exiles, starting with Egypt. Even though we normally don't count it, but Egypt is represented by the tle. Remember? Mm -hmm. How's that? I'll give you just a few verses. Start with Exodus chapter 8, verse 22. So it says over there that when we wanted to go out and serve Hashem in the desert, we were asking, Moses was asking, please let my people go to serve me in the desert. And we were going to do these uh, sacrifices to God. Pharaoh summoned Moses and Aaron, and he said, go ahead, you know, go sacrifice to your gods here in Egypt. What did Moses respond this is, again, chapter 8 of Exodus, verses 21 and 22. Moses responded to Pharaoh, It's improper for us to do that, you know, for we will sacrifice the abomination of the Egyptians to our God. We will sacrifice, it's a question, uh, we will sacrifice the deity of the Egyptians before their eyes, and they will not stone us? Rashi says, Yep, yeah. To'evat Mitzrayim, <laughs> which really means the abomination in the, of the Egyptians, meaning the deity of the Egyptians. Um, um, okay, it would be a hateful thing for them to see us slaughter their God in front of them. Wouldn't they stone us? 
And by the way, just so we should know, in Genesis 46, 32, when the brothers come down to Egypt, Yosef has some words of advice. He says, you know, we want to keep Jewish, and we want to marry only each other, and we don't want to assimilate. We have a lot of things to be proud of, right? We brought monotheism into the world. We, we know we have a mission. We don't know yet. We didn't reach Mount Sinai, but we know we're going to be freed. We want to stay um, uh, unassimilated, if that's a word, we want to, right? So he says to them, when Pharaoh is going to ask you what you do for a living, this is what I want you to tell him. So number one, whatever he's going to tell him, it will keep them uh, in a separate area. Um, and let's read it. It says in Genesis chapter 46, verses 32 through 34, The men are shepherds, for they were always owners of livestock, and their flocks and their cattle, and all they have brought. So they came down to Egypt. And, it come, and if it comes to pass that Pharaoh calls you and asks you, what is your occupation? What are you going to say to them? This is what you should say. Your servants have been the owners of livestock from our youth until now, both we and our ancestors, so that you may dwell in the land of Goshen, because all shepherds are abhorrent to the Egyptians. Ki to'evat Mitzrayim son. All shepherds are considered an abomination to the Egyptians. Look at Rashi. Uh, at the bottom he says, because the sheep are their gods. Um, just keep this in mind. There's one more verse I wanted to bring. Um, that's good. Um, that we, the Jewish people, slaughtered the Egyptian gods, you know, uh, deities, false deities, on Passover night, right? The firstborn are killed. By the way, there's a whole deep thing about the Tleb being the firstborn zodiac sign. We're not going to get into that tonight, all the spooky stuff. But basically, we were told to take their God, slaughter their God, and put the blood of their God on the doorpost of our house. Okay? And you were not allowed to cook in water, the Passover offering. You had to put it on a spit and put it on an open fire. And if you know what it's like to have millions of people cooking on a certain area, meat on an open fire, dripping, oh, right? Dripping, dripping into the fire. It's going to be a lot of smoke. Waft, wafting, that's a word? Wafting smoke throughout all of Egypt, or at least that city we were in, near Goshen, and whatnot. And they would know we killed their God their supposed, alleged, false gods. But that's what the Jews do. We, we kill falsities. We stand up for truth, and we slaughter sheker, false things. Okay? That's why we're so loved. Okay, next. The clear car goes on and explains. Galos Mitzrayim, the exile of Egypt, is symbolized here. Remember the word, he yit gal betok olo. He revealed himself or uncovered himself in the tent, this is back to the word gullus, that he, that he set a precedent for the exile. Number one, with Egypt, because they served the deity called the Tle. And what about Babylon, the gullus Bovil? So that is represented by Nebuchadnezzar. You'll see that in Jeremiah chapter 4, verse 7. Um, it says over there, you actually have to read several verses before and after, but in Megillah 11a, it goes through it a little bit. Um, but basically in Jeremiah chapter 4, verses uh, 6 and 7. Raise a standard to Zion, assemble, do not stand, for I am bringing evil from the north. That means from Assyria and a great destruction. A lion has come up from his thicket. And the destroyer of nations has traveled and has come forth from his place to make your land into a waste. Your cities will be desolate without an uh, inhabitant. So this is Jeremiah uh, warning them about the upcoming um, Nebuchadnezzar and his army coming against us from the north. And he calls him a lion. Okay, so now we understand in the Medrash that the Sutton came and offered up the lion as an offering. And then the Galo Shlishi, the third exile, 
is, is the Roman exile. Al Yedei Ha'uma. So it says over there in Psalms chapter 80. Oh, I, I forgot to skip. I, I meant to read for you Megillah 11a. Resh Lakish introduced this passage, which an introduction here, that's from Proverbs 28.15. As a roaring lion and a ravenous bear, so is a wicked ruler over a poor people. A roaring lion, this is wicked Nebuchadnezzar, as it mentions about him, we just read Jeremiah chapter 4, verse 7, and Rashi over there says regarding the lion, that that is definitely referring to Nebuchadnezzar. Now we're call, talking about the Chazir. Chazir is Rome. The Chazir is, he calls it a boar, right? Um, that's how they translate it here. Um, in Psalms chapter 80, verse 14. The boar from the forest gnaw at it, and the creeping things of the field graze at it. Um, basically, there is something... At the end of Rashi, speaks about this uh, beast of the forest. The boar of the forest is Esav. Esav is Rome, as it's written in Daniel chapter 7, verse 7. And it devoured and broke into pieces, and the rest of it trampled with its feet. Um, basically, what does it mean? You know, the pig is different than the other non-kosher animals, because it has split hooves, and it says, see, I'm kosher. See, I'm kosher. Right? And so um, the swine has some signs of purity. Esau, too, does have some of the merit of our forefathers. In Daniel chapter 7, verse 7, the verse says, And after this, I saw in the visions of the night, behold, a fourth beast, the fourth, the final exile, awesome and dreadful and exceedingly strong. And it had a huge iron teeth, it ate and crushed and trampled the rest with its feet. Again, this crushing of the feet. And it was different from all the beasts that were before me. And it had ten horns. So Rashi says, what, what's the ten horns? Uh, you might have thought this has to do with the ten um, northern tribes. No! It has to do with the ten different kings who ascended the, Ro the throne to Rome before Vespasian who destroyed the temple. Now, that kind of finishes that Breshit Rabbah, Medrash. Now the last two lines are very important. Bear with me. There's a thing called Otiot Shniot. What are Otiot Shniot? You have an alphabet, right? Alphabet. So the alphabeta. So whatever, like we have in Gematria, there are values. We have all kinds of different ways to do Gematria. We talked about Atbash, meaning A to Z and is replaced. B and Y and replaced. There's a way to do gamachi like that. It's called Atbash. Look it up. A T B A S H. There's all kinds of ways to do gamachi. There's a thing called Otiot Shniot, where you take the letter that follows it. Okay? Or, okay? or the letters that came right before. In this case, the letters that come right after. So we mentioned in the very beginning that the Satan came and joined up with Noach in order to be a partner with him in getting drunk and getting the vineyard going and all that which it entailed, uh, as we spoke about the different offerings. So the word anavim, anavim means grape or grapes in plural. Shutafu shel samich mem aleph lamed. It's a partner. The grape itself is a partner with the samich mem aleph lamed. That is the official name of the Satan, okay? We'll call him Samach Mem for short. But you have the Samach Mem and the Aleph Lamed. And if you take a look, I have number 25, the very letters, right? What follows the Samach is an Ayin. What follows the Mem is a Nun. What follows the Aleph is a Bet. What follows the Lamed is a Mem. So you basically have, right, the word Anavim, the Otiot Shniot, partnering up, pairing up, let's say, with the Samech Mem, Aleph Laman. And the clear car ends by saying, Remez Nachon, Shinizdaveg Loa Satan. This is a very proper and well thought out a hint that shows us that the Satan joins forces joined up through 
the planting of the grapes. Okay, so basically, I'm going to stop here. I wanted to just give a bracha. We're starting a new year. We encourage our students to, you can send me emails. You'll get the actual English sheets if you want. Otherwise, you're stuck just with the Hebrew sheets. It's fine, as long as you're learning. Um, if you want to share these videos, we encourage you to share the videos with your friends who are interested in learning Torah. And um, we should have a blessed year. Right, we are end, we've just entered a brand new year. It's the eighth year of the seven year cycle. We just had a Shemitah year. Bizrat Hashem, we should see the coming of Mashiach in this special year. We should all be filled with lots of health and happiness and joy.